knowledgeable in the sport rank him among the greatest racing drivers of all time. People who never follow racing easily recognize his name. He is synonymous with auto racing and with driving fast. Excuse me, sir. Who do you think you are, Mario Andretti? From racetrack to Madison Avenue. Not in Indy cars. From the pits to Hollywood, Mario Andretti is part of American culture. He became a household name by winning races in the 1960s, winning many races. Creating a legend takes more than merely being victorious. The Andretti legend was created by how he won, and because he won in so many different types of cars. Other drivers have won more races in their particular specialties, but when one looks at total victories in all major forms of automobile racing, Mario Andretti stands alone. The Mario Andretti story is an American story. For seven years after the end of World War II, Mario and his family were forced to live in a refugee camp. They finally left their native Italy for America in 1955 when Mario was 15 years old and settled in Nazareth, Pennsylvania. The family had $125 in cash and didn't speak English. There happened to be a primitive dirt track in Nazareth and very soon Mario and his twin brother Aldo were building and racing their own stock car. Mario was immediately successful and after his apprenticeship on the dirt track ovals of the Northeast he drove his first Indianapolis type car in 1964. The next year he moved his career into high gear. He finished a strong third in his first Indy 500, scored his first major victory later in the season and went on to win the year-long national championship for indie style cars. A year later, Mario was in victory circle eight times and easily won his second national championship. In the next two years, Andretti went from being known in American racing circles as an excellent IndyCar driver to being known internationally as an exceptional IndyCar, stock car, sports car, and Formula One car driver. In 1967, he entered the Daytona 500 and shocked the stock car racing establishment 
by stealing their most prestigious race. A month and a half later, he co-drove to victory in the 12 hours of Sebring sports car race, one of the most important road races in the world. Then at the end of 1968, another chapter opened for Mario. He entered the United States Grand Prix, and although it was the first time he'd ever raced a Formula One Grand Prix car, and the first time he had ever seen the Watkins Glen Road Circuit, he qualified on pole position. It was a staggering achievement. In 1969, he won the Indy 500, and he won it in style. A practice crash had destroyed his car and could easily have killed him. Undaunted, he drove a year-old backup car to victory. Then two years later, he won his first Formula One Grand Prix race. He'd been racing at the top levels of the sport for only seven years, and yet he had now won in every type of car. And whenever Mario Andretti stepped into a car, he meant to win. He drove flat out, and his love and passion for driving was evident for all to see. Andretti was known for his style as much as his success. Then in 1978, he capped his career with the most prestigious championship in racing. After winning six Formula One Grand Prix races, Mario had become the world driving champion, only the second American to do so. His passion for the sport still burned, and he kept on winning. In 1984, at 44 years of age, and driving against competitors 15 and 20 years his junior, he won his fourth champ car title. And yet he continued and continued to win. His last race victory came in 1993 at an almost impossible to believe 53 years of age. It wasn't until the next year, when he was 54, that Mario Andretti decided it was time to give up racing full time. Assessing his legacy is easy. He drove the careers of three men. He drove with a passion and joy that few have ever equaled. And he won in every type of race car and on every kind of race track. That is the legend of Mario Andretti. You've clearly driven almost everything with wheels. And well, from midget cars and sprint cars, on road courses, paved oval, dirt tracks, and everything in between. And in every notable race in your sport, Mario, what was your favorite car to drive? Thank you. Mario, what was your favorite car to drive and your most memorable career highlight? I must have turned this thing off. Thank you. Well, that, that's a very good question, and it's a complex question because uh, I, you know, I was so fortunate, as you say, to, to be there for a long time. I've left a lot of moments in my career, so it's hard to find the favorite car to drive. But when it comes to the sports, and the sport that obviously was my profession, motor racing, I can tell you that every car I want to race with, I fell in love with. And that particular day, it was my favorite car. So when I look back, and look at my victory, that's really how I got this car on today. Yeah, that's a good the question. What's a career highlight for you? Uh, career highlights, uh, I must tell you, here again, I was very fortunate, but uh, there's always something that's very special. And uh, when I was born and raised in Italy. And uh, the background, that the family did not really include motor racing or anything, any such thing. But as a young lad, I fell in love with the sport. And uh, in 1954, 14 years of age is when I saw the, the biggest race at that time, which was the Italian Grand Prix in Monza. And uh, that's when the ball was passed. That's when I said, Gosh, I mean, or I said, God, if you could ever bestow something on me and allow me to be a racing car driver. And that's where I clinched the World Championship in 1978. Um, obviously, it's, you know, you talk about living the dream, and that was it. So, as you can see, I've been, I've been blessed and very fortunate. And so, when you were 14, that was the moment when you first considered that this 
racing, uh, racing is your, is your career path, it's your dream. When did you know you would really excel at the sport? Well, first of all, uh, yeah, starting at age 14, I felt that I, I never had a plan B, so obviously that's what I, I worked toward, you know, trying to uh, get involved in the sport, get started somehow, and, and I did. Age 19 is uh, 1959 is when I started my first season in the sport. And it was a very special beginning with my twin brother Aldo. Uh, we had one race car, two race drivers, and, and we were winning the open races. And it's not until about three or four years later when we started, I moved down in the ranks and started racing, competing against, you know, some of the best in the business. That's when I thought, you know, I think this may work for me after all. Because you have to be realistic and you have to measure up to the competition that has been there, you know, the high pounds of the moment. And, um, and again, that's, when, that's what gives you hope, that's what gives you motivation. Uh, and that's what, you know, every young, youngster in any field of sports or, or competitive field, you always measure yourself against the competition. When you feel that, uh, oh, uh, I'm winning here and there, then the encouragement is, I think, uh, I think I can do this, I think I can make a living with this. And boy, did you. To date, you are the only one of two drivers to win races in Formula One, IndyCar, World Sports Car Championship, and NASCAR. You won the 1978 Formula One World Championship, still the only American to do so. Four IndyCar titles and many, many more. We're talking over 109 career wins on major circuits. So, not having a plan B really worked out for a <laughs> What drives you to always be the fastest? Oh, I think it's a lot of pride. And, I mean, ultimately, you know, when you devote a lot of time and effort in, in what you're doing, and you love, you have a passion for your work, then, you know, what's the reward? You know, the ultimate reward is to be able to excel, right? Any given day, be the guy, you know, the person who kind of does the best. And, and I think it's that, that sort of, uh, I would say that excitement is what drives you to repeat it again. It's, um, once you experience being at the top, you want to keep it there, you know, and that's your motivation because nothing else comes close to it. So, again, that's, and I think the, just the love and the passion for my work was uh, no problem for me to stay motivated because I look forward to going to work. And I look around even my friends, how many of my friends look forward to going to work. You know, unfortunately, uh, not everybody does, but the ones that do, probably do very well at their job. And these words are so true for our industry. You're uh, surrounded by a lot of hard workers here who really enjoy what they do for sure, so they're speaking to our hearts. With your Indy Car win in April 1993, you became the first driver to win Indy car races across four different decades and the first to win automobile races of any kind in five decades. Five decades. What's your advice for career longevity and in particular maintaining your legendary brand throughout the years? Well, here again, uh, you know, you. A lot of the passion and the love has to come from within. Uh, my advice is, if you have that love, especially early on in life, you know, just pursue it no matter what. And you'll be surprised, I mean, the odds of my 
we could be coming to race driver. I remember still dreaming about it as a teenager. It was so, I mean, in, almost impossible. But, I mean, I even had an issue, problem with my old father, which did not understand the sport, you know, all he knew of the talent teams, you know, so I didn't have his blessing, that's for sure. In fact, the first season, 1959, my brother now, Aldo and I had to race without the knowledge, you know, and the only defense we had was that his leg was buried. You know, so, so the, the, as far as advice is that you really believe in yourself, believe in something, you know, just don't be discouraged. Uh, there are always going to be, you know, some issues and lumps on the road and all that sort of thing. But uh, ultimately, if you really want to achieve it, you will. I mean, it's just the way it is. And there's no written formula to take you there except just your own desire. How come so many people are talking while you're talking? <laughs> It's an industry thing. Yeah. So, um, given the political climate and um, talking now post career, as many of our viewers know, Mario, you appeared on the finale of Celebrity Apprentice a few seasons back, giving Donald Trump quite some ride through New York City. You guys have to check this video out on YouTube if you haven't seen it. What was it like to meet the now Republican presidential candidate? And is he the same man off camera as he is on? Now that's a lot of questions. Um, you know, he, he was uh, obviously when we were filming that spoof for his last you know, the event of the season. Um, it was fun. It was fun because, uh, you know, I took him around with a two-seater race car and uh, he was so worried about his hair. And, and I assured him that uh, I would mess it up. You know, so I tried to do my very best, you know, to keep that intact. And uh, so we, we, again, you know, we had a ball with it. And I thought that after the primaries, since I gave him such a good ride, he would nominate me as the VP. You know, but I didn't hear a damn word from him. You know, so and I'm kind of glad in a sense, but, uh, but here we are. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, I don't know what persuades me people think, but uh, it's been an interesting situation to watch, uh, you know, this uh, road to the to the White House again. Sure, for sure. Well, uh, this is a good week. Uh, I don't know if Hillary was in the car if I would have messed up her hair or not. <laughs> well, talking speed and drivers and rides of our lives, Gil, you built this amazing building from the ground up. And in true... Thank you. And in true Andretti style, in record time, under one year, this building has uh, grown from the ground up. And that includes, just last year, you built a new room in Tata's Cable Landing Station, right next door. So tell us about the story of this location. What was your thought process when the idea started growing through your head? Well, it's been an interesting ride. You know, we started this process about two years ago, and it was John Helick and I who started talking about this in the course and so what the partnership could look like in terms of building a tier three site at a cable landing station. In essence, building a cable landing station campus. We talked about it for a good six months and worked with Martin Kaczynski, who's here also negotiating a deal where everyone agreed and made sense to build this building. And last October, we broke ground. So today is September, and we built this building in 11 months. And I gotta tell you, it would not have happened if it weren't for my team. Like any sport, you have to have a team behind you to support you. And I've got Frank Perugia, who 
was a designer for this night, inspiration to us all, worked countless hours. Uh, Felix Seda, who helped him as well. Greg Riedel, who hasn't seen his family in months, worked with us tirelessly on it. But uh, the vision behind this building was a culmination for me in my career. Uh, I sold my company in 2008 and I retired. I retired, I played golf, I worked around my family, I traveled, um, but it was a void marketplace. I wanted to do something else. You always want to have something to go back to, and this building for me represents a legacy. I thought they were going to have it in our family forever. It's something that goes back to our industry that allows people to do things you can't do before this building is built. And Marin, for your benefit, you're sitting in a facility where cables travel across the ocean. Tata Communications owns a cable landing station next door. The cables go to the UK. We've got a cable coming in from Brazil. This is the first and last stop. The fastest way to get down to Brazil happens in here. And we're here in a room full of friends that all are in the industry in another way. And like you in racing, we all work together. We cooperate, we compete, but at the end of the day, we have good food, we drink, we celebrate, and we chat during these conferences. Deals are getting done. So what are the interconnection possibilities here, Gil? So, so as I said before, being in a cable landing station is really the most robust part of the, the, the network that exists. You can connect to backhaul providers like Altice, Teo, Light Tower, Windstream. They all have fiber assets here, and they can bring you directly where you want to go to the US. So, in the simplest forms, traditionally, New York City was a point of failure in how we could meet other countries. We've got rid of New York City by putting this building here and having a place where these networks can now directly go and connect financial centers, connect media centers in Ashburn. It's the, it's the most important. It's a garden facility, so they will all be back. Location, location, location. Isn't that what they say? Particularly true in real estate. Also, with the speed of networks. This is when it becomes critical. So, tell us, Gil, what makes this location critical to subsea connectivity and speed? Well, again, having a part of electronic communications and a facility like they built next door allows us to rapidly connect their cables. So it's really a connection point and to a lot of the big banks to a lot of the apartments as well. You know, we don't want to sell this building ever to one tenant and it not make sense we're going to maintain that for the whole way through. And I wanted to also just acknowledge we have the mayor of Wall here, Marie Conti back there. I just want to make sure everyone realizes she's here. I want to thank Wall Township for their support in letting us build this building at record pace. Um, lots of great folks in this room. I just wanted to make sure I acknowledge them. And uh, John, for Tata Communications. As we know, Tata is a brand known for fast and secure global communications. And as noted by, cave, uh, by Gil, your cable literally comes ashore just steps away, which makes this location on the Jersey Shore critical for speed. And with NJFX's added marketplace, businesses and networks can come in, connect to a global fiber network, and quickly be taken anywhere around the world. So John, tell us more about your network reach and your speed. Sure. Talk communications. Uh, we have two cables that land next door, right? But uh, your cable service provider has a whole other ring around the world. Literally on Tata's cables. We can start here in Wall Township, New Jersey, send a set of lights, and have it come in and hit the, uh, go through Japan, hit our uh, U.S. West Coast sites, and uh, end up back here if we want to do that. So, uh, from our perspective, this is a, this is a, it's, it's great to have this tier three facility right next to a cable landing station because I think going forward, this is going to be more of the model you're going to see throughout. As networks grow, capillarity and reach was really important and it still is. But as enterprises move more applications, data, and storage to the cloud, they really want to be able to reach data through okay? And having a tier three facility right next to that, that set of connectivity solutions is a really unique approach to the market that I think is really going to see legs and it's really going to influence how things are built in the future as well. For sure. Absolutely. 
And how do you see the NJFX, AB Room, and Data Center catering to Tier 3 networks, adding this extra layer of speed and capabilities? Well, again, the whole goal of a lot of what Dylan and I talked about with NJFX is not just a pure data center building, basically a platform. Right, where you can go, you have rich connectivity solutions, whether you're trying to reach something domestically in the US or in the other four or five continents of the world business wise. So I think having a rich connectivity set, getting a set of providers in here, okay, that offer maybe different applications, needs and services, and make this location more valuable to an enterprise or to an end, uh, end consumer is really going to create that platform and that uniqueness. That people are going to stick to this. People are going to want to have space, power, and get services out of here. And uh, they're doing it truly old school, right? No plasma entries for the baby room? We are. So our model really is the original Telex model. We don't charge for very easy prospects. Why? Because I love all the guys in this room. <laughs> all the guys in this room are trying to get deals done. I don't want to get in the middle of their deal. They're chatting back and getting something done. But the bottom line is, we as a real estate player should not be in the communications business. What we want to do is support our customers. We want to support customers like Sparkle, Tata, Level 3, and Wind Street. And when a deal gets done, why surprise them again with a very feat? It's a surprise gotcha. So for a predictable victim, we stick to a real estate play. All we try for is space power. That's all we try. Now, I have one last question, and this will be for all my panelists, but if there's a question out there in the audience, feel free to raise your hand. I'd love to, love to hear from you guys. So my my question again for, for you three to all respond to. You three men, in your own way, made a career in getting from point A to point B with unbelievable speed. And you were trusted brands as such. John, I'm going to start with you. Looking at your professional growth over the years, were there any hurdles along the way that you had to overcome and important lessons learned that you can share with us? Uh, for any career, right, uh, that, that to be measured as far as how I go day, whatever your definition of success is, you have to overcome hurdles. I think one of the ones that I would point out today, in today's day and age, that is a bit more of a requirement, but I think that uh, is a continuous struggle, is in the age of distractions, with social media and always on connectivity. And as a, as, a, as a business, we're always presenting new opportunities to go investigate, to potentially build. It's, it's, it's a myriad of things coming at you all the time. So to me, it comes down to, you know, how do you go about the discipline to focus on what's truly important to achieve your definition of success and making sure that you maintain that visual or that, that perseverance to only focus on those and let a lot of that noise and those distractions go away. True, true. Mario, there must have been a time during your staggering career that must have been particularly challenging. For instance, in 1979, when the new Lotus 80 car wasn't particularly competitive, or the 1982 controversial wreck with Kevin Hogan. Tell us a bit about how you overcame uh, your challenges. Well, uh, as you can imagine, when uh, you live in a highly competitive world, uh, you're going to have some glitches here and there. As a matter of fact, if it was easy, obviously it wouldn't really be important. Uh, and, uh, and, but the, the thing is that when you get knocked down, it's how you get up and brush yourself off and go on and, and win again. You know, it's, uh, uh, it's all about believing in yourself and uh, knowing that it's, you know, it's not going to be a bed of roses per se, always. But after the hard work, the rewards are there. You know, and that's what keeps you, you know, motivated, keeps you driving on. Uh, again, it's uh, if you're fortunate enough uh, to be there for the long pull, and uh, in our business, there could be many interruptions if you're unlucky and you're injured for a long period of time. 
where it was something that was very prominent in all the decades that I've raised in. And, you know, I'm just counting my blessings to the fact that I dug a lot of bullets. I was able to continue on. Out of the, about 900 races in my life, and my career spent 40 years, only missed two races because of injury. And, and that's because I was really, in many ways, very, very lucky. And, and I know that, and I'm forever thankful. But again, as, as actually, as John said, as far as there are different ways of measuring success. In our business, you measure success with, you know, to some degree, how many trophies you have. But uh, it, it's also with the relationships that you build that last a lifetime because of opportunities to meet people, individuals, and uh, and and appreciate culture around the world. So just uh, it just uh, blows your dimension, you know, to. Uh, incredible image and that so all these things are part of what I feel you can consider success and um, and I think I've been blessed with uh, pretty much all of them and I'm still living the dream today. Okay. Oh, the other question? Go ahead. Who is the toughest person you ever raced against? Who is the toughest person you ever raced against? Well, there's another loaded question. Who is the toughest person I ever raced against? You know, there were too many drivers. You know, my career was two weeks. It would have been easy. You know, but uh, every decade or whatever even has just that new that. You know, as a, you know, like a thorn on your side, always. And in almost every decade that you go, it's somebody that sets a certain standard and a certain discipline. And uh, and again, I've had many. And I usually resist mentioning these people because I'm always thinking that I'm going to forget one. But uh, the Japanese tour, the Asian poets, you know, that's the answers. And my, actually, my own son Michael is a pain in the ass because he's so good, you know, so, uh, you know, again, uh, I look back and, uh, and I've raised against some of the icons of our sport, you know, in the last 50 years, and, you know, and that's precious in every possible way. More questions? All right, good question for you. After seeing the film, Rush, which just dramatized the Formula One scene of the late 70s and just the exciting time of it, the rivalries between James Hunt and Nicky Lauder. You're in the mix for that. What was your take on that film? What was the What was your take, Mario, on the film Rush? <laughs> now, if I'm going to be a film critic, <laughs> you're going to hear a mere four. Because, as you can even imagine, the film rush was portraying real life of uh, two individuals that uh, were absolute stars of the moment, and but typical Hollywood, they had a way of uh, sort of uh, going their own ways and describing certain situations. And it did not really illustrate the facts exactly as it were, you know. And, and some of the critical facts about the Nuremberg when Lala was hurt, about the supposedly the meeting that uh, supposedly had taken place among the drivers and to not to start the race because of uh, the conditions, that never happened. I was there. <laughs> You know, and uh, so there were a lot of things that uh, were not exactly true to what the story was. Uh, the casting was phenomenal about the two characters. The rest of the casting was terrible. Some of the vulgar um, language that was used by uh, one particular team owner and manager was never existed. That man was very polished and. Uh, and very correct and very eloquent. And so, uh, 
And so the movie box is now one of my favorites, but I, it did not really, uh, I think it was a good story, Hollywood style, uh, but as far as even um, sort of showing what Formula One is about, it was not really, you know, represented. You know, so it missed it in a lot of steps, and that's why it didn't get any nominations, and it went to Never Never Land. <laughs> that's my side of it. And our last question, Hill, your turn. As we can all see, this is quite an impressive facility. So, Gil, were there any points throughout this year, about 11 months, of building where you had to muster up strength and persevere anyway? That's a great question because there were many moments where we were worried about what was going to happen. But what comes to mind, um, Labor Day came by and went. We were still paving the road out in front. We still had painters sitting here. We had 100 men working in the building, electricians, you know, HVAC units. And we said to ourselves, when is the date for this party? September 21st. We announced that date months ago. And when we did we made a commitment to all of you, we would have Mary Wendrin here. Thank you again for being with us. I promised our partners Tata, who came in from the UK to support the event that we have a party we would come to. We promised our friends we'd play golf in the morning. And, um, and we had a lot signed up. Jim Martini, Doug Corbin all came in, put down their suits, put on hard hats, grabbed paintbrushes, and we started working. My team stopped, didn't stop working. 12, 14 hours a day for the last three weeks. And even three days ago, we looked at each other and said, are we going to make a mistake? And here we are. Thank you all for being part of this whole day for us. This was not easy, but well worth it. We're glad to share this whole facility with you as well. Thank you. Excellent lessons and insights from each one of you. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for tuning in to JSA TV and JSA Radio. Happy networking.